My name's Hugh Possingham. I'm a professor of ecology and mathematics at the University of Queensland. We've just looked at how we can understand climate change impacts by using empirical observations. Now we're going to look at climate, looking at climate change impacts by using models, statistical and mathematical models. Models are everywhere. In fact, everybody's a modeler. Consider the situation where you're trying to buy a pair of shoes for a relative and you, what you really want is them to be happy when they get the pair of shoes. So you're effectively trying to model their preferences. You want to model what they want. And of course that model will be based on things you know about the person, their age and their gender. Of course, models aren't always right. And sometimes you buy a pair of shoes thinking they'll like it and they won't. However, it's much better than just saying, I'm going to buy a pair of shoes and I won't even think about their preferences, their age and their gender. So models are good but models aren't perfect, and we're all modellers. One of the models we see very frequently comes up in weather forecasts every night on the news. Again, weather forecasts we know are pretty good. It does tell us a lot about temperature and rainfall for the next two or three days. Over a week it gets a bit more dodgy, and over two or three weeks they're fairly useless. But it's a common use of a computer model. We haven't made empirical observations. We're predicting something that hasn't yet happened based on mathematics. So one of the other reasons we use models in ecology is so that we can understand things that we can't manipulate in experiments. For example, if we're studying a bay and we're interested in sea level rise, it's infeasible to raise the sea level in that entire bay. And then in large areas like the entire Great Barrier Reef, if we were interested in increasing the frequency of hurricanes and studying the impact of that, which is something that might happen with, uh, with climate change, that was clearly impossible and also we couldn't replicate the experiment. The other good thing about these models is that we have to put all our understanding in them and when we predict what's going to happen and then we observe what really does happen, we can go back and say why were our predictions wrong, why was our understanding wrong and therefore, therefore we can refine the models we have of these systems. So in predicting the impacts of climate change on species, the first thing we really need to understand is the niche of a species. That is, the, the range of environmental conditions in which a species lives. For example, this penguin and this frigate bird. Under what circumstances can they live in the marine environment? So getting to the chin strap penguin, we could study that species and look about where it lives and dies and breeds and look at its abundance. And we invariably find for most species there's a range of temperature where they're common, some temperatures where they're very common. And this would be also true for other environmental factors. And that's our understanding of the niche of the penguin. Uh, we would have empirical observations to support that data and then we can correlate abundance with temperature for any temperature. And hence now we're getting to a position where if the temperature changes we can predict what's going to change with the abundance using this niche style of representation. So let's use that now to start looking at species distribution models. That is models that tell us where a species are existing in space. And we're going to use the example of dangerous jellyfish, which is of course of great interest to tourism and local communities. We can look at the temperature, and this is a hypothetical example, across the east coast of Australia, which is a region where dangerous jellyfish are found. Uh, there's warm areas in the north and there's cooler areas in the south. And we can also then use that and look at the probability of dangerous jellyfish. This could either be from sampled data or it could be from actually incidents where jellyfish uh, sting people. And there are places where there's high probability of dangerous jellyfish occurring and there's places with low po probability of dangerous jellyfish occurring. So if we have this data on where a species is, we can build a statistical relationship between the temperature and the occurrence of the species. So while it's not necessary to fully understand the mathematics behind that, I'll try and explain the broad concept. We have some observations where the jellyfish is not and observations where the jellyfish is. And we use that observation to find a line of best fit, clearly, uh, where the temperature is cooler, the chance of finding a jellyfish is very low. Uh, when the temperature is a lot warmer, the chance of finding a jellyfish is very high. And this curve summarises that relationship. Basically, with that relationship, we can start to build species distribution models. 
that tells us what happens to jellyfish as temperature changes. So we can simulate the changes in the environmental conditions knowing what we already know as the relationship between the species and those environmental predictions and we can predict into the future. So now let's think about our jellyfish again. Uh, there on the left we have the current temperature, there on the right we have the probability of dangerous jellyfish occurring in this hypothetical example. As times passed, the temperature has warmed and the warmer bands shift south. And at the same time, using our statistical model, we can make a prediction about how the high probability of jellyfish moves south and we get more dangerous jellyfish in regions like Brisbane.